Hi, thank you for attending. My name is Raul. I do iOS and Android at Pristine, and Aaron Alani is, is with me as well, and he does Android and Glass at Pristine. Okay, so iSight is our HIPAA compliant communication solution. It's uh, powered by WebRTC, and we try to keep the UI and user experience with physicians in mind. So what does that mean? That means like minimal call clicks uh, and a simple call flow. And so why did we choose WebRTC? Uh, there's cross-platform native support between platforms, including Android and wearables, iOS and browsers. Now I'm going to dive into why and how building a WebRTC client for Android or iOS is different than the browser. So here's a familiar diagram you guys have all probably seen. Um, the difference here is that we replace the browser with LibJingle peer connection, the JAR and the SO. Now this is pretty much where the difference comes in. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail here. So what exactly are we building when we go native for Android and iOS? We need to compile peer connection for the target platform, either iOS or Android. There's two parts, a mobile layer and a native layer. Now, the native layer consists of like stuff like libvpx, uh, libopus, uh, voice and audio engine, and bandwidth estimators. And the mobile side, we have setting up the camera for the platform, um, connecting to the interface and protocols. And uh, one thing I wanted to mention as well is AppRTC demo was very, very important for our development. We needed to get AppRTC demo working correctly and so we need to understand AppRTC demo before we can make our own WebRTC solution. So as I was mentioning earlier that we had to make those libjingle, uh, libjingle files, uh, these platform specific APIs are not available for Android and iOS. For example, there's no Maven or CocoaPods repo where a, a normal Android or iOS user would just expect to be there and then just pull it down immediately. Um, this means we need to build the libraries rather than expecting the platform to support it. Um, and every revision change is a pretty expensive update. We have to retest everything. The call might not work after 90 minutes. The audio might drop out. There could be several problems. Um, so we basically have to go through a long testing process for each revision. So we're very careful when we update revisions. So here's the WebRTC build process that we have to we follow through. Um, so if you're targeting an Android uh, device or an iOS device, Either way, you'll need, or sorry, for Android, you'll need to install the Ubuntu build packages, and for iOS, you'll need to install the Apple Xcode tools. That's like a prerequisite for every machine. Um, and then after that, we'll need to clone and pull depot tools, which is our Git and SVN client. WebRTC has so many small libraries that it's pulling from that we'll need a Git and SVN client together to work to pull all these products in sync. Um, once, we, once we get the G client, or sorry, deep, depot tools set up, uh, we'll need to sync WebRTC by sending the target platform to either iOS and Mac or Android and Unix. And then at that point, we have an option. We can use a custom G client file to add in changes like camera or H.264. And then we prepare WebRTC by running G client run hooks. At that point, we have all the make files there in place. And we can run Ninja AppRTC demo, which will build all the code just for the, uh, all the native code for AppRTC demo. This will ensure that we don't try to compile code that's not built for the right target, and which will almost guarantee a failure. Um, and then you can publish this archive into either an archivo repo or CocoaPods for an Android or iOS developer to pull down. And Or you can just use our build scripts that we open source. Um, they're really simple to use. All you have to do is just pull down our GitHub repo and just source the build script file. And you can do build AppRTC app for Android and dance for I iPhone. Um, for the iOS version as well, I also had an Xcode project that runs AppRTC demo with an Xcode. So you guys don't have to worry about all the complicated stuff underneath the hood. Um, so I'm going to hand it off to Aaron, who's going to explain a little bit more of the iSight core. Thanks, Roel. So we spent a lot of time familiarizing ourselves with the WebRTC repository, the build process, and then the artifacts that are sort of the, the byproduct of that build process. And we didn't want to walk away empty-handed. So we, wanted, we set out to build what we call iSight Core, which is a native uh, WebRTC sort of wrapper library that allows us to build our client applications on top of this. Uh, my talk's going to be mainly Android-centric, but a lot of these principles we use bu uh, building out the iOS application as well. So we set out to build the core with a few goals in mind. And the main goal being, you know, how do we solve this general problem? How do we 
leverage the native WebRTC libraries to build out a video streaming solution that'll work cross-platform natively for all devices. And uh, as Rule mentioned, we spent a lot of time building, uh, uh, working with the AppRTC demo, uh, which in our, in our case is an actual the Android AppRTC demo and the iOS uh, AppRTC demo, uh, unlike the, the web version that's available to a lot of you, uh, a lot of you guys. Uh, and you know, we poured over this code and we sort of broke it down into three ma major components. Um, so we have to have a signaling uh, module that sort of handles the, the, what we call the WebRTC dance to sort of get a call up and running. And then we need some sort of a wrapper to interact with the native libraries. And then in addition to that, we have to build out a you know, client-specific UX for each platform. So here's a bird's eye view of the core sort of in action. So it's composed of two components. You have the signaling component, which is interacting with our signaling server and relaying stuff like the ICE candidates, the offers, the answers, uh, and sort of sending them across the line. And uh, we have our peer connection wrapper that sort of interact, mediates the communication with our, native app, with our application and with the native APIs. And collectively, these two work together to push out very client consumable events uh, for, for each application. So you know, the iOS app doesn't really care about receiving an ICE candidate. It just really wants to know about, is there a call incoming? Is my call connected? Did they hang up? Did the call drop? So we, we wanted to abstract all of the, the WebRTC dance to, into very client consumable events that can be you know, built off of. So dive a little bit further into you know, what's inside the core. And as I mentioned, the libjingle wrapper that we have mediates that communication between our application and the native libraries. In addition to that, since, there's so, since we're trying to be very cross-platform with our, with our application, we have to configure these uh, STP packets uh, for different contexts of, of a call. So you might have an iOS device calling a, a Glass device or a, an Android device calling a Glass device or a web browser calling a Glass device. We, have to, we, we handle all the STP mangling inside of this portion of the, the core. In addition to that, probably the most important feature of, of our wrapper is that it encapsulates the interaction with the native libraries in a way that's friendly with the Android lifecycle so that you know, users can opt into our app and they feel like they're inside of an Android app. They feel like they're inside of an iOS app. It's not just some you know, video streaming application. And the signal wrapper is much, much simpler. We, you know, we also implement Socket.io. I know a lot of people have been talking about how they use WebSockets. So for Android, we use Android Async. It's a very good, uh, very fast uh, socket I.O. implementation for Android. And on iOS, we use AZ socket I.O. And this is much simpler. It's just a message dispatcher. It doesn't compose messages. It just gets a message from the peer, our peer connection wrapper and sends it across the line. And I kind of want to just show a brief example of how, you know, what, what I look at on a day-to-day -day basis compared to what the, you know, the standard WebRTC uh, API looks like in the JavaScript. And it, as you can see, it's not really much different. Uh, clearly, don't don't like think that you can build something off this right here. It's just kind of a short example, but I just kind of want to show the similarities uh, between the two. Okay, so there are a handful of WebRTC solutions out there, and I, I really wanted to speak to our work on Glass because I feel like that's what really sets us apart as a technology company. So before that, though, we had to sort of talk about some of the constraints that come with developing on a platform like Google Glass or or any other wearable device for that matter. Uh, and you know the, some some of the obvious things are like these hardware bottlenecks that you don't really have to think about, you know. Whenever well, you have to think about it a little bit, but not definitely as much for you know something like a wearable device. Uh, so these these glasses, you know, physicians are walking around their Wi-Fi networks, and you're, they're walking in and out of you know good and bad Wi-Fi spots. I know the, uh, the the guy from Atlassian made a really good comment about most of the time it's just a problem with the the Wi-Fi, but you know they don't really care. <laughs> So we have to sort of you know, build around that, especially with glass, because the, the response time to, to Wi-Fi events is definitely a little bit more delayed than a traditional Android or iOS device. Uh, in addition to that, the, the CPU is a real main, main concern of ours. Um, so we use VP8 to obviously encode and decode frames uh, inside, our, inside our core library. Uh, and you know, we, we see great performance between an iOS and a regular Android device, because you know, the CPU power is there to do the VP8 encoding and decoding. But we definitely see a bottleneck effect whenever Glass is forced to do this, this sort of VP8 encoding in software. Uh, we, we are trying to work with, work with Glass specifically to try and get some uh, H.264 support. Uh, it's it's, it's kind of hard to uh, sort of guarantee uh, any sort of great performance improvements, but we have been working with that as well. Uh, in addition to all of that, battery is also a huge concern of ours because, we, these, like I said, these devices are in constant 
movement. They're you know, walking from room to room. In some cases, they're even in an ambulance. So we have to sort of build our app with the notion that these, things, these, these applications need to last all day. And in addition to all that, uh, UX limitations for a wearable device, it's, it's completely different. You know, we can't really, we have to really simplify the application for a wearable user so that they don't really feel confused whenever a call's coming in or they're in a call. That we really want them to feel like everything makes sense while they're in a call. So with that, I'm gonna talk about some features that we built out for, specifically for Glass. <laughs> yes, yeah, this is a, I have to thank our business dev guys because this is, this is really good. <laughs> uh, so I'm sure we've all in some capacity are familiar with the AppRTC demo on the web. And you know, the standard demo is, is showing your local video in the top right hand corner and then the remote video you know, gets most of the screen real estate. Uh, we, we didn't really have a compelling use case for showing the, the, per, the person calling a glass device's video. Uh, so in addition to that, we didn't really want to waste any you know, decoding time uh, trying to decode these frames coming across the line from a client user. So what we decided to do was just only, only send video from Glass. And if you're calling a Glass device, you don't have to worry about sending your video, and Glass is not even gonna receive it if you try it. Um, so this, this kind of allows us to you know, preserve battery life on Glass and, and you know, build a, a UX uh, that makes sense. And so on the, on the left there, you can kind of see the uh, early implementation of our app and has a black screen for the Glass user. And then of course, across the line on the other side, you see the game of operation. Very quickly, very quickly, we found that uh, glass users want to see what they're sending. Uh, a good example of this is, you know, when a surgeon's operating in the room, uh, their 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 vision is is not is uh, not necessarily looking at you know what's probably the most important part of the call. Uh, they might be looking straight ahead, or you know, and they might be looking down like this. Um, so we added a viewfinder so that they can line up, you know, their their line of vision with you know what's going across the line during a call. And sort of add on to that, uh, since, we, since we don't really have a use case for showing local video when you're calling a wearable device, you know, whenever you call a wearable device on any of our, on our applications, you get this, the full screen you know, of, of that wearable device. So you know, you, they have a, uh, on the left there, we have a nice uh, picture of our capital uh, in Texas. So uh, you can kind of get a feel for the entire screen real estate from a wearable device. Uh, and just to kind of juxtapose that, we have a, an iOS to Android call. And since we are sending video both ways, you definitely want to show your local video so that they can see what they're sending across the line. OK, so with that, I uh, kind of want to do a quick demo here. Uh, hopefully, it goes OK. But we're going to do, uh, so roll has got his glasses on. I've got my glasses on. He's going to call from his iOS device, and I'm going to call from my uh, glass device. OK, glass. Start eyesight. And as you can see, you can share voices with Glass. <laughs> so we're testing. All right. So I'm calling, and uh, you should see a little, a little prompt come up. And I apologize, the lag is pretty apparent whenever you're doing Android screen monitor here. So I'm answering the call, and there you go. You see the oh, oh I think I lost a call here. Anyway, on the left, on the left there, you see uh, Roll showing off the the viewfinder, and if he actually swipes back on the D-pad, it'll actually disappear, and we can, you know, we can use this to save battery life in you know situations where you don't really need to line up a call. We swipe forward, it brings it back up. <laughs> I'm wondering what happened to mine. Oops, I'm sorry. I just took a picture of everyone. <laughs> wrong, wrong application. <laughs> yeah. Huh, interesting. Anyways, uh, so that's that's really all I have. I'm gonna wrap it up here. Uh, so if you want, if you're interested in what we're doing at Pristine, you can check out our engineering blog at tech.pristine.io. We we like to blog about once once or twice a month. Uh, and at this time, I'll open the floor for any questions.